Welcome back to the Levity Zone. Join us for one of the Zone's regular tubcasts, spirited hot tub conversations with none other than Alan Lundell, a.k.a. Dr. Future, my dear friend in these mountains for the past 22 years. In a wide-ranging and bubbly conversation, we cover the bases from the search for life beyond Earth to our own cosmic ancestry at the very birth of our own world, to how we might best survive and thrive for another 500 years. We round it up with the thought that all we have to do is to wake up to how rare we are and to the wonder of what is, rather than falling into stories invented by others. So please join us for a typical night for two characters at the edge of the West, or at least at the edge of the wet. Okay, Dr. Future here, talking to Dr. Damer. I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, Bruce, about... Here in the Tubcast. In the Tubcast. Four. Right. <laughs> and there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, a karmically correct solution I'm looking for, or something that would be, uh, that would be ecologically correct as well. And that has to do with the NASA uh, revelation on Monday of the water plumes coming um, from a moon of... From Europa. Europa, Europa, yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, that means they can sample mm-hmm. the water there to see if there's any hydrocarbons in it or yeah. other forms of yeah, life, they, right? Fly by, yeah, fly through. Yeah, we, we've been actually writing a paper... Yeah. for um, a special issue of astrobiology in, uh, about Enceladus, which also has plumes. And Dave has been in contact with Chris McKay, and we're crafting this paper. Uh, Chris basically says a 100 microgram sample is kind of the viable sample to, from a f- fly through to collect those crystals that are coming out. 100 micrograms? 100 micrograms. Not so a lot. It would go through and it would capture uh, 100 micrograms of, uh, of liquid. It's water. actually all, fro- it would be frozen, frozen volatiles. Frozen volatiles. Water and other volatiles. So we'll see what the volatiles are. Yeah. And would we actually be able to detect um, signs of life in that? Well, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, we were at a meeting at UC Berkeley with all the right people in the room uh, yeah. back in May, including... Uh, Richard Matthews, who was the head of uh, chemistry at UC Berkeley for years, and he's an instrument designer. Yeah. And he basically sort of laid out the kind of instruments you'd have to take those organics or those volatiles and look for the organics. Um, you wouldn't likely be able to sequence polymers. Um, you, you, you'd be able to, to see more simple organics. Uh, but, well, I guess the best thing to do would be to capture some water and bring it back to earth and then and analyze it in that's, labs here, right? That's a challenge because the re- energies for a return flight once you've got to the outer solar system like that are, it, it's tough. You've it's, you really got to initially It's at least uh, an extra 200 million to figure that well, out. more, I think. Um, <laughs> for the return flight. You, you want to be able to do it in yeah. situ so that you can do multiple passes. Mm. So a billion dollar problem. It's a billion dollar. Returning it's, water from, you know, from Europa. Oh, it's I a, just saw a meteor. Or a meteor. Returning water from See, Europa. See, now that's, that's returning water from the outer uh, solar system. Uh-huh. So why not just capture those? Well, because you want to know if there's any life on Europa. Right. Now, the, what we're writing our paper about is, uh, the, we're writing about the two hypotheses, the hydrothermal vents versus the hydrothermal field. So life in the ocean. Yeah. Starting or life on land in fresh water rather than salt water starting. And arguing uh, both hypotheses, presenting them. That's what we're doing in our paper for this special okay. issue. So the presumably the the plumes in Europa are, are, and Enceladus are coming from hydrothermal vents going off uh, deeper. In the ocean, yeah. so, which means there could and the warmth would be caused by gravitational um, could be effects or, from or, Jupiter or by volcanic active actually volcanic. active live volcanoes. So, so they have yeah. plate tectonics would be alive on, on not necessarily on the moon. plate tectonics, but would be there'd be cracks 
in the in the crust that would allow hydrothermal fluids to penetrate and then get heated up and then get shot out. Okay. So so cracks, but but not not plates, because these are very small moons and you know they probably don't have plate tectonics. Right. Well, here, here here's my seminal idea on this. Uh, I'm sure you've thought along these lines yourself on occasion. Um, let's assume they find it's just you know water and there's no life. Okay, that it's mm -hmm. you know, there's no life as we know it there biology. It, it seems to be pristine water, you know, and mm -hmm. and maybe some hydrocarbons. Uh, meteor, yeah, yeah. that's the expected stuff from yeah. carbonaceous meteorites. But they say that there's a lot of water there, right? There's yeah. like three, t uh, like at least as much as the Earth, if not more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If so, then um, you know, from our species' point of view, it's not the greatest colonization place in the world. But what if we? thought of ourselves as stewards of this planet and our planet wanted to expand its ecosystem to other planets and we helped it do that. That's part of our species job is mm -hmm. to help the uh, the Gaia expand yep. her, yep. her uh, realm. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And so she would look, if you look at it from the, with her mind mm -hmm. and you look at this massive bottle of water, what would she think? Well, what inoculate it with suitable single cell organisms single cells so yeah. you would you wouldn't start off with putting dolphins or whales in there they would be become freeze dried instantly <laughs> uh, because the surface <laughs> I see. you know these planets don't have no atmospheres and uh, have heavy radiation well, on this the is, surface okay well these fish, moons is there, what's the most advanced you, extremophile you, on the planet that could live there happily oh, in your estimation uh, probably you'd need Go under the Arctic ice or the Antarctic ice and look yeah. for extremophile uh, single-celled. Oh, okay. The thing is, you can't rely on photosynthesis, right? Because they're too far out so and we, the ice is too thick. So you you can't. So you have to use chemosynthesis. That means you have to get organisms that live at, at the chemical uh, effusions from hydrothermal vents and see if you can imp implant them there. That would be the plan. That's Mother Nature would love that. She but would. It, it's complicated yeah. because. Most life on Earth yeah. depends on photosynthesis. Yeah, so you need to get the right microorganisms for that kind of yeah, mission. Yeah, you need right? to get them to the right place, and whether or not they can survive in those conditions is anyone's guess. Yeah. And and how are you going to drill through a, a mile of ice? You know, and and put them into the right, and then go through the ocean, then go through 200 miles of ocean to get to the hydrothermal system. How are you going to do that? Uh, well, you know, those are good questions, and it would probably take real brainstorming to figure out. It takes a uh, lot more muscle than we've got. I mean, I've heard, I've heard different schemes, you know, like using a, uh, a, a small nuke uh, a generator to, to, on, to overheat and would just bore a hole down to the ocean, to the underwater ocean, right. by being red hot. Stuff, stuff uh, will break. The problem is all I've this stuff... Of, Breaks down. But it's all these. It's all hypothetical, right? It's now. all hypothetical, and it will yeah. stay hypothetical for the. But that's the. It's the imagination space, right? Yeah, I, I think it's. You know, finding signs of life on Mars is challenging enough. When Mars could viably have had life early on, that's visit that, that was at the surface. Yeah. It's not there anymore because of the radiation and the desiccation, and so what we're arguing, our team was arguing, uh, in the last few months, is that the next Mars rover in 2020, mm -hmm. the 2020 rover, would go to a preserved ancient hot spring. Huh. A hot spring that has left uh, its rocky outcrops and traces at the surface. Because if life existed on Mars, it would have potentially started at a hot spring and then it would be its last outpost. Right. So find the old hot springs, mm -hmm. check out the sediments there. To see, look, look for stromatolites, layering. Yeah. Uh, in the if you can find it, um, and you know that's your probably your best shot because that on Earth, the oldest forms of life evidence for life on Earth is preserved hot springs. So that's a clue. That's a clue from it's life. It's a big here. clue from life yeah. here. So why not check it out there for that? And yeah. of course, I think that even despite the fact that Martin and Tara will make the case in February for going to a hot spring, and there's three known ones, uh, they probably won't. Uh, for the site selection, they probably won't get their their way, mm -hmm. which is ironic because this is supposed to be a life detection mission. Well, okay, now let's let's say you're mother mother nature and you're looking at Mars. Would you say have any organisms for her? 
given our current uh, um, ecocycle? Ice, yeah, ice living, what would what I've always thought since I was a kid, actually, I've yeah. thought that these kind of, they're not halophiles, but these, when you see, um, they're algaes, I think, that live live in ice and snow in Canada that make it pink. You may, you've seen those, right? Here uh, and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what, you, what you get with that, so in the Martian polar cap is, uh -huh. is ice, it's water ice, so it has some melting. So during, that would be good. So, That'd be good. Yeah. but you can have ice living uh, organisms uh, in that polar cap. They have a shot because they have some protection from the ultraviolet radiation, um, and they have a water source. Do they need oxygen from the atmosphere? That's a problem. Um, if they do, they're out of luck. Toast. They're toast. So, yeah. um, that that's a problem because all you got one one hundredth the atmosphere. Of yeah, Earth, and it's mostly um, CO two. Yeah, and uh, CO two, yeah. CO two, yeah. So plants like that. Yeah, right. but you know you've got low pressure. You've got it, it's a terrible environment. It's super extremophiles. It's, <laughs> yeah, you um, maybe uh, more cave cave extremophiles. No, right? because they require lots of liquid water. All all life on Earth that lasts any period of time has to have be liquid in water. liquid water. And what's the most water uh, conserv conservationist form of life there is? Do you think? Um, there's cactus. Single, no, no uh, there's single-celled organisms that look can like be desiccated completely for a long periods of time and come back, but then their their metabolism just kind of almost shuts down. So and without water, there's no metabolism. So it's a form of. Um, uh, it's I a guess form of bacteria. Hibernation, in a way. It's a type of hibernation. Hibernating um, microbials. Hibernating microbials. They're always the toughest survivors. You know, tardigrades, of course, can survive vacuum, and, but they're a little, they're small little animals, basically. Wow. But the problem is tardigrades need to feed on something, which is all these other organisms that are a food chain. So if you have no food chain, you have no nothing complex. Oh. So you're back to really simple microbial mats. Oh. And and the problem is that Mars is just dead. You know, it's there's no active hydrothermal fields. There's no rain. So even for, even for no. the Gaia, it's going to take a special. It's so, dead. Yeah, it it's is really hard. It is living dead. in the bottom of our spaceships is is pretty good then. <laughs> yeah, I mean the toilets on Elon's yeah. spaceship are far more alive than any place on Mars. Huh. You know, and so and I don't think hey. any amount of. Poking and prodding is going to solve the problem. Uh, it's beyond our science to it's think beyond, of uh, rejuvenating that planet. Yeah, it's beyond, I mean, maybe in a thousand years, if we could divert several large comet nuclei. But the thing is, you have a whole planet. The problem is, you've, it took a billion years for it to lose its atmosphere and its oceans. You know, right. that's a lot of material. And is yeah. it really worth all that effort? Well, yeah, I mean, you were talking about um, floating colonies could be way more interesting. Well, they're way more cost-effective. And, and like, 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 let's go back to um, Gerard, you know, Gerard, Gerard O'Neill's L7. Yeah, yeah and, and okay, and, and, and in terms of our conversation, let's go back to uh, Jupiter um, and the vents of Europa, the water vents. Uh, would that be a good location in space to have, like, uh, a little human colony? No, maybe? No, no, terrible. Um, well, even though there's lots of water coming out. It, it's, you're nice dealing, views. You get incredible you're, views. The, the, the liquid water is is kilometers down in the in the ocean. When it comes out of the surface, it freezes because you're in ultra cold environment. Yeah. And you're in ultra high radiation environment. So it's not good for the human Jupiter. body. No, and you don't have an atmosphere, yeah. and you're just sitting on an ice. Good vacation uh, <laughs> for your android. Yeah. No, it's um. And then you not, got Titan, not for biological life forms. But then you got Titan, which is also. You know, a moon with a huge atmosphere, much heavier than ours, much thicker than ours, but it's all super cold hydrocarbons. Huh. So it's hydrocarbon rains, it's methane oceans. That's another place best visited <coughs> virtually. Yeah, no, it's, it's, none of those places are very viable for. Yeah. N no, I, th I think there more be natural virtual locations, though, to visit. I think uh, to actually get the sounds and the feel and the kinesthetics yeah. and translate it into some kind of uh, multi-sensory uh, immersive experience could be quite interesting. Um, 
But nonetheless, uh, for, for actual biological life, uh, what what would be fun? I mean, the, L, the Gerard O'Neill's L5 locations? Well, you think the, that's the, the highest top? <coughs> anywhere, and this is the Shepherd project. Yeah. Anywhere in the solar system, and you can create your own worlds. And what we came up with, Peter and Julian and I came up with Shepherd, which is not getting much attention, but I still believe it's the all, it's a sole viable path forward. Asteroid capture? It's, you create, you, you get an asteroid that's a thousand tons, that's 50% water ice. You, you put your enclosure around it, yeah. you introduce atmosphere, and then you start boiling off that, that water ice. If you boil, if you if you heat the interior, just such that the entire asteroid becomes a liquid globule, like a single droplet, the rocky stuff will go into the center, and now you have a sphere. You have a sphere of water, full packed full of amino acids and everything else from the rocky part of the asteroid. You've got an Which ocean. Which is uh, food and fuel. Yeah, you've got an ocean around a rocky core, but it's really small. It's a miniature world. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere now is getting to be more like uh, Earth, and maybe it's 50% sort of Earth atmosphere. Outside, mm -hmm. you have a huge solar collection surface on your balloon that you can use to light the interior and to heat the, <laughs> to heat yeah. the interior. Solar on one side, light on the other, so it'd be a decentralized sun well, right in the whole sky? The whole thing can be lit with LEDs yeah. inside, and, and it can be heated by simply rotating uh, absorptive... Uh, surface fabric toward the sun. I live under an LED sky. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> so, now you have, and it's anywhere in the solar system in a certain It can certain travel band. then, right? It can, it can travel, because you can use the gas to push the globule. Ah. And so, all the solar power, and so now you've got a moving biosphere. So, you inoculate that with Terran life, where you can control the temperature, and the gas yeah. composition. You can create a nice balance of uh, creatures, too. Huh? <clears throat> you can. You can design like one of those glass globes, you know, that people Why? buy that have so shrimp that. in them and they have yeah. some, and they're closed off. They're, yeah, they yeah, don't yeah. have, they're sealed in, but yeah, they, so they live for years. You could have a Hawaii version and a. Yeah, they live for years just yeah. with light coming in. Yeah. So we know that this works. So this well, is. I live on a barren planet when you could be in Hawaii in space. <laughs> yeah, so this is the no brainer low-tech solution of creating biological support systems in space. Yeah, it's, yeah. And it's... Well, I think portraying those is going to be the next level then. I mean, the visionary-wise, I mean, don't be afraid to go out a hundred years, you know, to see what a, what a really uh, comfortable... So that's what <coughs> Elon's done. That's at least a hundred years out for some of his ideas. <coughs> you know, this... You know something like Shepard could yeah. be proven up and working by the late 2030s. Well, there you go. We might and actually be alive. It's, it's, yeah, it's low-tech. It's, it's yeah. low technology. It needs demonstrator flights. It needs uh, missions to identify the targets and go and encapsulate and, and move them around. And it's, it's an all-in-one technology to solve the resource problem. Yeah. And, you know, I'm bummed because nobody, including Elon, and nobody has picked this up yet. I'm well, confident, however. Maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe it's... Um, it's not time for yeah. it. It's yeah, timing is everything. And maybe you're supposed to stay uh, in charge of it rather than to give it away to someone like you. I, you know, I kind of gave it away. But well, you did, but it still got it. <laughs> so, yeah. so maybe. maybe yeah, nobody, uh, nobody else has picked it up. So. Yeah, so it's like, what's its next push, I guess? Well, you know. Virtual like, version of it? Here, here's a natural, because I think the yeah. TEDx talk does it. Nine yeah. minutes, it does the whole thing. Yeah. Um, here's the natural next step. So say in 2035 or 2029, uh, an, a comet gets caught in the Earth-Moon system. A, a real comet. It's coming by, it gets caught, and it's, it's rotating around the Earth and Moon, and its tail is burning off. It's burning material off. A comet, so it's got lots of good molecules lots on it. Lots of good molecules. Yeah, water. And this is what I asked Brad Blair acids. 10 years ago. Give me a good... Comet. Give me a good comet. And I said to Brad Blair, what if this what if this comet got caught in the Earth Moon system? And he said, Well that would be the most valuable real estate in the solar system. It would have thousands of tons of water ice and it could be turned into fuel and every spacefaring nation would be trying to get control of it. Because they have such a valuable resource. <clears throat> such a value and then I said, Well, why don't we learn how to go and get those then? You know, forget mining the moon, forget 
processing Mars's yeah, atmosphere. That would nonsense. be maybe the metaphor of the low hanging fruit might apply here. Yeah. So so this stuff is flying past yes. the Earth. What? So in 2032, one of them does get caught. Yeah. Or it's it's predicted that it will get caught. Some entrepreneur, probably not Elon, because he'll be old by then and <clears throat> whatever, will say, "I'm going to go capture that. I've got six years." We're going to fly this Damer Geniskin's not idea, and we're going to develop it quickly and prove it up because we've got fabric structures in space already with mm -hmm. Bigelow's space module that he just put on the space station. So those are pieces to that puzzle, too. Those yeah. are actual livable habitats that are yeah. and comfortable so, and then great, <clears throat> great views, right? That's what you want also. Well, to capture that object, so as yeah. it comes in to, to literally catch it and... Uh, manage it and handle it because you, you not only have to wrap around it uh, to you have to prevent the volatiles from all leaving so you have to shield it and start to lower its temperature so you have to and wrap it around and, and so it doesn't all boil off you see you put the the wrapper around it and then you have to move it then you have to start uh, using its own gas you can then start to to move it and put it into a stable orbit, and then harvest nice. it. Harvest it for 30 years. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and keep its temperature down. And then, when you need volatiles, you just raise the interior temperature, just by rotating the closure to the black side, to the sun. And then suddenly you're you're now extracting. It's well, like a gas pump. How how uh, <clears throat> much uh, food and fuel could you expect a, an average size comet to produce? Depends on the size of it. I mean, you're talking. <coughs> like, okay, give us an example. Like, you're talking about one that's like a football field in diameter. Or that would, yeah, that would provide, you know, hundred thousand tons of, of uh, water ice. Hundred thousand so, tons. Hundred thousand tons. So that's, you know, vast amounts of fuel for Mars trips, back and forth. So that would that would. And for shielding, to put in, in the fabric enclosures for the HABs to yeah. shield people from radiation and for cooling. And then you're getting CO2, methane, uh, you're getting carbon grains, you're getting all kinds of stuff, probably amino acids. And these, okay, and, and so these would become uh, ships in and of themselves once you put a yeah. hot they, they become... They um, be they're an entire, they're like a refinery. I see, and, and then you, they're navigable at that point they're, too. They're, yeah, they're manageable. They're, they're yeah. movable so slowly and gently. They're movable. So there are resource designs, and then there are tourist designs. I guess that would. Uh, so yeah, you you would just basically use them to lower. You know, you would back up with a stinger and take your fuel load to go on further. So there are refueling stations. You could have hundreds of them, hundreds and hundreds of them. And this is, you can see this as being. Uh, actually existing in by 20 I mean I think if somebody started to invest this could happen this could be a functional system in the 2040s all right well I think what gets people's attention is where uh, where does the average person get to have fun with this uh, what uh, where does it get interesting for uh, well for I mean the, the non-scientist the 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 artist the musician uh, yeah, it doesn't. Um, it, it, <laughs> well, zero gravity. You know, zero gravity is a lot of fun, right? I, think, I mean, uh, I think that it, if you, you you have to go back to the basic space business. So, well, you have the if, infrastructure that needs to be built first before it gets to be interesting. Yeah. So if like, you like building the interstate wasn't fun, but then all the fun things that people do by using the internet. Yeah. Yeah. So the the thing is the, inter the interstate. The, the first place you're going to be selling fuel in low Earth orbit for missions that go beyond it and lowering that cost. So instead of Elon having to build a gigantic launcher that launches six or seven times to lift water Yeah, you want to get the fuel in space. Yeah, you can get it all in space. You do not need those launchers. Yeah. You, you're going to launch a lighter ship, fill yeah. it up, it's because it, and Given the existing launch. rocket technology, it's prohibitively expensive to take it off the planet's surface. It's not particularly good for the planet either to remove its... Uh, yeah, no, whatever Elon says... Yeah. If it's 20 launches of a of a heavy booster to lift the water for a Mars trip, that's 20 launches. That's mm -hmm. that's billions in cost. That's billions and billions in cost. Yeah, the more it costs, the less likely it's going to happen. 
basically. Yeah, it's, it's a huge barrier because who's going to pay for it? A private company's not going to pay for it. All right, well, then what is the path of least resistance? Where can you, like, slip this in for nothing <laughs> at the right time, right? That yeah. superconductivity exists at the right time. It could be a high net it worth could be a individual that says, I'll put $100 million a year into this one project for the next 25 years. $100 million a year for 25 years. And that's not a big deal for and, them. Yeah. And a team will just go at it and fly their, do their prototyping on Earth and start flying their demonstrator flights and then prove up the technology. Um, and then in 20 years, they now are prepared to go and get resources. Mm. You know, and that's one way to do it. I mean, <clears throat> the way that the electric car business was built was a was trillion dollars in cell phone investment. Right, but that that had actual customers. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. That what about the space tourism customers? Um, I think that's what Elon's going for. Right? I think that they're two hundred thousand each. It's very, un, it's very very uncertain. I mean, the here, I mean, uh, you know, Richard Branson's thing. Big and low's going on that, right? Branson is into that. But uh -huh. there, do you realize that there were, you know, there were eight or nine space tourists. Yeah. launched by the Russians. There have been none for the last few years. And, you know, Virgin Galactic, which isn't even orbital, yeah. uh, was supposed to be launching people on their trips by 2012 or 2013. <laughs> right? And and they had a crash. They had a fatal crash. A, a pilot from Scotts Valley. Huh? Yeah, who died. And yeah. so that's pushed that back to 2018. And those are just suborbital like joyride flights yeah. so we're not you're not looking at you know and is when when spacex starts carrying people to the space station in a few years are they going to be carrying tourists or are they just going to be you know they're only be carry four or five astronauts so in the 2020s you might see a resumption of space tourism but a, not by a small uh, massive scale. numbers. Really. No, no. But I guess I guess where where it's the path of least resistance in my mind would be um, I don't know virtual world connection, you know, tele telepresence, uh, telepresence, uh, where yeah. you actually uh, are on Mars, you know. Uh, yeah, and but you know, then again, that's a, that's the, a the, Mar the, the Mars twenty twenty rover is going to have the, the same mass cam, yeah, similar hardware. Yeah. And it, it might give you more of a sort of 3D cylindrical view, but that's a science mission, and that's run by gearheads, right? Yeah. And after a while, I mean, you, Carter does this. I mean, Carter Emmerich flies people over virtual Mars in his planetarium all the time, you know, uh, from orbit, from orbital 3D data. I would imagine that would be a crowd pleaser. It is, but, you know, for a while, but then it, it doesn't grab you. You know, you... He does it all the time, and I've been to those well, sessions a couple of times. What I imagine is this, you know, uh, more of a social VR space is where, like, you go to Enceladus or, yeah. or Mars and meet other people who are interested in yeah. that, or meet just hanging out there. And, and You know, that's not going to fund actual missions or anything. That's something that, no. that anybody could whip up those graphics over a weekend. Kind of thing. Well, no, it'd be based on real data. I mean, NASA or the yeah, science you know would put out really good probes that collect the, information the, the, for decent uh, problem, immersive experiences. Here's, here's the problem, and we faced yeah. this back ten years ago. The real landscapes aren't that interesting compared. Really? To, no. You don't think so? You think it'd be really um, boring to be, be near really Jupiter? Boring. It'd be very boring because in, in an immersive world, where you're for a while i mean you by yourself on, yeah but if you, you have meet other people there yeah but then you may be, as well just be at a virtual cocktail party and then the other people are interesting but the, you're dealing say on enceladus yeah. it's just a big flat plane of ice and, and it'll have interesting colors to it like you know but, the grand canyon you think well there would be the grand canyon and stuff like that first i'm sure because yeah. more accessible but people go there they see it and that's fine and they don't go there a lot you know it's a I don't know. I don't. I don't think it's a it's a market driver. Hmm. Solar system is not that not as interesting as our own planet. Yeah, I mean this this forest, you know, carries for us 
far more interest than, say, the, the mostly gray lunar lens. Especially with the play with the zoom function, you go down to the microscopic yeah, level. Yeah, no, there's things yeah. happening. Birds are flying. I mean, this is tremendously more interesting. So this planet's way more fascinating I mean, to, to most people. Mars probably. looks like a really bad part of Arizona. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, I see. And, it, and it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, well, that's very pragmatic thinking about that. Yeah, I have to be pragmatic because mm -hmm. I've seen these patterns over and over again. I've seen proposals like Elon's mm -hmm. 25, 30 years ago over and never come to fruition, you know. So I just don't want to even bother getting excited. I'm, I would rather see an incremental progress on something real in my lifetime. Well, I, th I think if you can figure out what the group mind would really enjoy with this or really appreciate I mean not I mean what I found is that most uh, the group of most of the species is not are not scientists they're and, not and not they don't engineers have, they don't have the, the, the fascination for what is like scientists yeah. you know? and for whatever reason I, I you know they they just don't they don't uh, but they have fascination for each other you know I think most yeah. of the species bandwidth is for other members of our species and species-centric thinking yeah uh, and you know mating opportunities and yeah you know um, yeah. Uh, you know uh, when normal what we used to call knick-knack reality Nick <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely right and that's that's what we've got to work with and that's fine too I mean as long as there's yeah. some visionary nerds that get funded <laughs> yes, to do stuff right. to take us to new places. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just all big cocktail parties, which is fine, you know. Orgies are nice too. <laughs> yeah, it's all cat balls. It's all uh, quite amazing, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I, I feel really privileged that in my lifetime, and it took 38 years to come up with Shepard. Uh -huh. So 38 years of thinking and pondering and meeting different people and doing different projects, and Shepard came out, and it's now out. And I can't build it. I can tell its story, but I can't build it. It's done. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel really privileged because I really believe it is an actual viable way forward for this thing. And then it will be rediscovered in 10, 20 years by somebody and built. Um, but the origin of life was to hedge my bets. I decided to work on a couple of cool things because mm -hmm. I, I would not live to see Shepherd fly. But this origin of life is paying off and it can be worked on every single day. You know, it's, it can be worked on with simple equipment and, you know, uh, things we have now and you can go out to Australia and touch the ancestors and it's like a here and now thing and I've got to work on that too no if yeah that's exciting that's really and that's that's right. a full 40 years 40 this is the 40th year I've been working on that one yeah that was um, 1976 was the start of that 76 yeah 76 that was um Mm -hmm. I guess when I first heard about original life around that time, um, there was a Dr. Grad at Allen Memorial Institute. Oh, and McGill? And McGill, yeah. Yeah. He visited him up in his lab, and he had several labs, he, he, and one of them was an original life lab. Oh, cool, <laughs> really? Yeah. At McGill? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah and he, he, uh, he and I got to be pretty, he, pretty good friends. And he uh, yeah, and I was studying it from a different point of view. You know, he was he was more of a biochemist. And this, you know, the the biochemistry of what we're doing, you know, Dave's writing this book for Oxford University Press now, and I'm starting to write a book for the public. You know, uh, on this thing, much broader scope and less technical. And that's actually what I got to work on in the next six months. I really can't go to Rainbow Serpent or any other festivals, or hmm. I have to start working on this thing because it's all running around in my head, and it's the whole picture of this thing. You know, hmm. it needs to have graphics, and and I'll put it out as serial articles. I don't care if I have a publisher. I just want to get it out and get it critiqued. Now, do you do you think 
do you think ultimately that origin of life can be figured out? That, that we can mm-hmm. that we can literally find the right conditions and ingredients to create life from scratch, we, if you will. We can. Uh, we can create something. But, uh, but that has implications, right? I mean, it, that it does. Uh, I would I would give a disclaimer that what we would create in the lab yeah. is what Carl Woes named in the 1970s. He called it a progenote. Mm-hmm. And the progenote is the thing that's on the way to what biologists would call a living system, but it has some living system elements in it, mm. and it has some physical self-assembly. And I met with his graduate student, who's in his 80s, um, at the University of Houston in January, named George Fox. And he looked up at me and he said, you have discovered... You've come closest to uh, describing the progenote that Carl and I came up with, huh. so that was a good that was a good uh, validation that we're close to this thing. So the progenote can be grown by hydrating and dehydrating solution and watching for molecular evolution within these little protocells and and constantly sequencing it, constantly pipetting and, and constantly stressing the system. And seeing if your little gel at the bottom of your dishes is growing and shrinking as, as its members become more robust. Mm. Now you have little robots key that tend those things, right? Yeah, yeah you could do it by and hand. Nanobots. You could do it in an automated way. Mm-hmm. Um, and growing of these oh, wow. gels and its molecular evolution, which is done in labs now all over the world. Authentic molecular evolution is done. Yeah. Jerry Joyce, Jack Shostak, all these people. But we're doing it in the presence of lipid, where they're contained in these lipid protocells, where the sets of molecules, sets of polymers that are synthesized and, and tested. And that's our model. And, and in, in my essay that was published on May 25th, uh, I had seven testable predictions at the end of the essay. And, what, and the last one was, you should be able to grow and test these gels. And they should be subject. They should become uh, subject to molecular evolution, hmm. and and that teams, you know, in five or ten years, could be actually creating these these things, these progenote things, and studying them. And and we we would say no, that's not a living system. It's something that is precursor. On, it's the progenote. So it's before Genesis. Progenote. And so it's before Genesis, but it's it's where biology is gradually replacing the functions of physics in <laughs> in a cycling system, gradually, yeah. um, bit by bit, yeah. simultaneously, yeah. because wet drying gives you synthesis. It gives you the energy you need to keep the system going. And then when you when you wet something, it creates bubbles that are floating there, and they're tested. And then when you dry down, the bubbles are all crowded together at the bottom and they're now interacting and they're protected within the gel and then when they dry down they flatten out and they dump dump all their polymers back into the layers and then the layers dry out and they resynthesize the polymers and then it wets again and then the bubbles are back in solution and it's it's the life cycle because the dry phase is synthesis it's like forming a seed on a tree Mm -hmm. then when the rains come the seed has fallen into wet ground and it sprouts and grows, right? And when, when, the, when the soils yeah. are still a little wet, mm. the whole thing can grow vibrantly. And then when the soils completely dry out, it's got to be ready to drop its seeds, right? Mm. Like a piece of, gra- like a, a, a tiller of grass. It has to be ready with its seeds when the soils dry out. And it drops the seeds, waits for the next rainfall or the springtime. Same thing, cycle. pattern of life. Cycle, yeah. And that that that, uh, that pattern, we, we discovered a model for it in hydrating and dehydrating pools. Yeah. Uh, and that there it is, you know. Yeah, it's a hydration dehydration uh, as a core to. Um, it's the core. It's, spinning, spinning it's the engine. Yeah. <coughs> it's the yeah. engine. Heat and uh, heat and cold. Yeah, because you because the dehydration gives you synthesis of polymers. So you can form proteins. You can you can take Bragg's amino acids, stick it in a dish in the presence of, of lipid, which you can get out of egg egg uh, yolk 
and uh, dry it down and it will force the Bragg's amino acids together to form longer chains wow. to form uh, peptides or cold peptides. You can do this in your kitchen. <clears throat> so nature was able to do this on land surfaces on planets like Mars and, and Earth, possibly Venus, for a while, right? No. But it did it long enough and consistently enough on Earth to go into the progenote to world. Finally started to get some results. Huh? Yeah, to go through the progenote world and into the, um, the single... It's like it's really hard to start a fire uh, by from scratch like that. So it takes billions of years right? and in the right conditions. Well... Breathing. You well, gotta... Yeah, you... Here's the trick. But the thing is, can you recreate it more easily? I think we can. I think we can do and this. The, and the trick is to... Figure out the original conditions and replicate them? Yeah, I mean, basically, um, what, what Dave and I have done, and Dave built the equipment in the lab, is been growing RNA in the lab this way, making it longer and longer. And the, the group in, uh, in Atlanta has been growing proteins, and the group in, in, uh, in Glasgow has been growing proteins oh. this way. Hmm. And they're starting a whole new round of experiments. So then what we're talking about is doing it all together, where we have RNA and peptides being synthesized in one, in the same dish, hmm. and see what happens to it. Maybe that's the way to colonize Mars with that level of... Uh, that's too fragile. Too see, fragile. see Mars, Mars had to have had that running on its own. Well, it's got the wet, uh, dry it, cycle. It would have had, yeah, yeah, it had oceans. Uh, hmm. It would have had hydrothermal vents. And, and springs everywhere, it had volcanism, it had a thicker atmosphere, it had rainfall, it had everything. And then it lost it. <coughs> yeah, the interplanetary war. Well, it was, it was, it was called David having, Wilcox, uh, having, uh, no, having no magnetic core. Mm, yeah. It had no magnetic core, so then the solar wind just blew the atmosphere off the top. Uh, no, no. Is that true for most planets? They don't have a magnetic core? We don't know that much. We don't know, uh, yeah. but magnetic cores, I mean, there's none. Mars doesn't have one. Oh. I would get, I don't the know. The moon? About, the moon's too small. I mean, the moon's, is the moon's made out of the Earth. Oh, I see. So the, the, Earth, yeah. the moon was made by a collision with what they call Thea, which is a Mars-sized planet collided with the early Earth. The early, and, early billiard balls. Yeah, and of, uh, and donated system. all that iron. So we got yeah. donated iron. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you almost have to have an iron core. So the planets that can do what we've done are rare, probably, that have a huge moon as a protector. Yeah, did Drake try to consider uh, he did. rarity, right, in the equation? And there's a great, choice. great book called Rare Earth as well yeah. that, that's worth reading and, and well, like one in a thousand solar systems or something like that oh, it's, it, you know yeah. and and to have it go to complex life is even rarer i mean it's mind-bogglingly rare yes it is interesting that on this planet even there are a trillion different life forms most of them microbial and we're the only ones like us i mean that that, that have a mm -hmm. advanced civilization yeah and so well, one out, one out of a trillion on a, on a planet that already is rare. Oh, it's right? already rare. It's this and is we're one fucking rare. species that somehow figured this out or somehow. Yeah, and we may be yeah. the only one because the planet's running out of time. Right. So we have a limited amount of time before we have to get out of here, get out of Dodge, and or the, figure out how to make it uh, more manageable. Yeah, and that's that's where this this whole game is at now, which is yeah. How do we make our civilization long-term sustainable, and how do we how do we expand off the Earth? If we want to continue to use energy the rate we are and, and build products and have babies and stuff, we have to expand. Yeah, that's, that's what Stephen Hawking yeah, this would says. Be, uh, Leary used to say this was the womb planet. Yeah, we have to expand, and we have to have viable. This is why I worked on this Shepherd idea for 38 years. Yeah. Yeah. I, to come up with an actual technology that would allow us to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm presented to, right here in Santa Cruz a year ago. Yeah. I'm trying to introduce the meme of same thing from a global to a solar system economy, solar system level mm -hmm. thinking as becoming the new norm. The problem is there's no market. That's the thing. I mean, <laughs> it becomes real for our species when there's a market, right? 
Well, that's that's yeah, probably true. No, it, yeah, it is, and so that's why uh, the people are thinking of platinum uh, asteroids and things like that. Yeah, but we plenty of platinum here, and we, we get can it. mine it out of landfills. Much cheaper, yeah. Oh yeah, no, it, that's not viable. So what's the yeah? So there's no real big allure yet compared to this planet. No, and there's plenty of capacity on this planet. That's the thing. I mean, we have another yeah. 500 years. We have a 500 year runway still. Oh, wow, okay. Well, we've got the natural gas. We've got you know, uh, we've got a huge amount of, of empty land. You know, we, we could we could have... Um, it's true, you fly in an airplane, it's mostly empty down below. We could have yeah. 25 billion on the planet. And we, we could, <laughs> with technology and new agriculture and whatever, we could continue to support growth. Yes. The good news is that growth rate is slowing, for the population growth rate. The bad news is that Every baby born now uses a vast amount more material and energy than a baby born 30 years ago. Because they can. Because they want to have smartphones and HTC Vives and all this stuff. Right. You know, right. and so, I mean, you look at the amount of gadgetry you and I have gone through that compared to somebody born in 1930 yeah, you know, who I had mean, a telephone and a record player and a maybe and got into reel to reel tape in the 60s and that's it that's yeah, the appliances that's right. that they had yeah even the digibar stuff is only oh my god half and of my lifetime not even the whole my whole lifetime but right just, uh, and and the stuff yeah. that that we've e-wasted i mean the, the the sheer amount of chipsets that we've gone through it's just and, and this we're just starting <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> so we, we're, we're, anybody who has a baby now is putting a huge load on the future. You know, the answer, of course, is to have one or zero babies per, per family. You know, that's the actual There are enough answer. humans uh, as it is. Uh, yeah, and we need so to, we need to stabilize slow. the platform, platform. We need to drop our population maybe by half. Well, that's what Bill Gates says. Yeah. And we can, we can, you know, China has yeah. a one-child policy, and that saved China from certain, you know, catastrophic poverty and a cycle of poverty. But it's mostly uh, uneducated people that have lots of babies. Mm -hmm. And once people have a sense of of uh, themselves born and more of a, you know, understanding of what's going on around them, then they're less likely to want to spend their time uh, child rearing and more time exploring yeah. uh, for themselves. You know, and if if we had a virus. I'm not suggesting anyone develop this, but if you had a virus that <laughs> For emerged, stupid people. <laughs> say no. something like Zika, but a mutation of Zika, <laughs> yes. that, no, that simply made people impotent, like, on a massive scale. <laughs> and that it took, it took 30 years to, so that people were mostly impotent, <laughs> um, Unless mostly non-fertile, except maybe 10% of the population was fertile, right? <laughs> Could become fertile. And then our population would start to drop. And it would take them 30 years to reverse the effects of this virus. And by that time, we'd have, you know, 40% of our current population. And we would have reversed all the resource trends, and no one would die. It's just that you couldn't conceive. No, it would... It would and there are probably a lot more wonderful sex to be had. As long as it didn't turn a massive number of humans into pinheads. And then that yeah, becomes no, a, that's not good. <laughs> that becomes a new civilization norm. And Which is what's people happening are, already. Smart anyway. people are being persecuted by them. What's happening with idiocracy? <laughs> yeah. So, but but yes, we know, must be careful. That that type of a virus, yeah, you know, would would immediately take the pressure off, and no one would have to die, and you know, potentially we could remake civilization in that period. You used to have a lot of empty nesters then, a lot of people without kids. Yeah, yeah, and they would be able to actually, you know. Uh, do different things. They would be doing creative works. They would be doing whatever they do. Well, you know, actually, it makes sense. But you know, and notice that in the the DNA, though, in the biology, there's a drive to have kids that's very strong. Oh yeah. You know, it's like primal. And people, and a lot of people have kids by accident. Well, know? even even like like Angela, for example, wanted a baby, and by the time she was mm -hmm. hitting getting close to forty, I mean, yeah. that, that uh, biological clock was ticking pretty loud. Yeah. And uh, there was some sense of missing out on life, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's no uh, sort of... Uh, there's just... That, yeah. It's not rational. It's not know. rational, no. Yeah, just you have to do it. 
Some men have that, but mostly it's women, I think. Yeah. yeah. But, uh... But yeah. once you get past that, that's basic uh, species operating yeah. system programming. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you go to a deeper level with that. Uh, yeah. Unless it's socially cued in that you have one child. Yeah, one kid. Well, see, one child works because then at least you could get the uh, yeah. the child rearing. Uh, you get schools genes. still and all that. but And you had the village. You had the groups of family yeah, families. Yeah, which is what China that. had. Yeah. It's losing now. Yeah. yeah. And China's going to use a lot of resources too. So. Oh, it is. You know, I don't know where we're going from here, but... You know, in a little fragile lifetime, like one person, yeah. you know, I figured with me, if I can contribute with working with Dave and other colleagues, that a, a, an understanding of what our ancestor was, that it was a communal unit, a, a network, yes, um, a collaborative system, and that yeah. the world still is that way, and then a pathway forward for humans, should they want to take it, to expand Gaia into the solar system and I will have done all I can do yeah. because I won't have created any babies and you know I won't have put my energy into that into creating offspring at all yeah. but I'll have created these two ideas which I th you know I'm pretty satisfied with you know uh -huh. even now I'm pretty satisfied that you know I need to work them for the next 30 years if I can just to try to help them be born but yeah, and help the help the birthing process. The birthing so. process of these and the raising of these two ideas. Shepherd being much harder, uh, but origin of life can be done every day. You know. And using your natural endogenous mind to figure it all out. <laughs> yeah, and and now putting my mind in the progenian period and trying to figure mm -hmm. out what their lives were like. Some right. informed them, speculation. Become yeah. them. <laughs> become them. Yeah, exactly. Which is what I was doing all July in Australia. I was becoming them. Oh, nice. And out at out at at symbiosis, like, what does the mat feel now? How? Because it doesn't have a mind like ours, but it can feel the patterning, the boot prints of our highways and our buildings and our. Yes. You yeah. know, and it, it, I, I I can see that. Yeah, and if you vanished your house, it would feel. This, it feels the space of the house. So there's no house. There's only these hollows and nooks and crannies and flows in and out of the earth, you know. Um, and that's what the mat feels. That's what the mat senses. Because well, consciousness is all about sensation in the beginning, you know. And if and we're all connected to the mat, right? Yeah, we're sort of we're outgrowth of the mat. We're intimately part of that, and we are occupied by the mat, you know. So it's a big part of our consciousness. So in a sense, the organizational principles of the mat uh, are uh, are uh, being applied around us all the time. All the time. Our derma, our skin, yeah. is a form of mat that yeah. goes around our bodies for sensation and for passing everything in and out. Yeah. And um, then the derma folds inside in your throat and down into your stomach and gut and helps you absorb things. Uh, from the mat when you eat an apple because huh. that's a product of the mat wow. and that all started with worms that had outsides and insides and guts that were moving through crunching through the mat and that happened about 800 million years ago the first grazers and they crashed the microbial world they crashed the microbial Eden because they just started eating the mats and nothing before them had had the technology to just chew up mat so that became uh, a new a mutation that caused them the mat to become it, yeah it was to be now consumed. food it was yeah. now food and so huh. it had to adapt but animals could now rise out of that out of that and plants arose on land when and this is a funny trick for you when the mat learned how to uh, grow rigid structures that then on the top of which could be folded more uh, solar collecting uh, members. So this tree up above us is simply a lignin based uh, rigid woody dead structure upon which on the outside is growing the collecting surface of the mat. Hmm. And, and, and it started off with liverworts and the liverworts still live in the Santa Cruz mountains. 
Hmm. They have a little hold fast and they have a little thing that comes up. And they're like a super early plant. Hmm. And the tree is a liverwort with a long, longer stem that has branches and leaves and stuff. Well, what role would you think that uh, radiation plays in uh, mutation? Evolution, uh, this evolution. Well, it, it means that during the, the mitosis of cells and the copying of the DNA, then errors are, can be made. Can be a, so there it can be an, errors. It's not a, an. It's not yeah, a, random rewritings that could create mut mutations, and that creates and sometimes the mutations are good. Yeah, sometimes they. So you get a like around here, a tree might have suddenly a, a split in part of its leaves. Huh. And the split might allow more leaf surface to curl around and get exposed. And so that tree has slightly more collection ability. And, and then suddenly, within generations, all the oak trees have split leaves. Because oak trees cross-breed all the time. Yeah. Huh. You know, and these things just keep going and going and going. And in microbial communities, the adaptations is, is so fast, it's ours. Yeah, I saw that, that video saw that from video Harvard, yeah, it was pretty, yeah. well, that was pretty amazing. Isn't that incredible? They go up to the barrier and then they go across it? Yeah, yeah, and yet, who who are we to have an immune system that can deal with that kind of predator? We can't. Um, I mean, every, our, yeah, every time we introduce an antibiotic, we, it, it's up against that. It's up against that, yeah. But our immune systems are pretty, if, you, if you're they're, healthy... They're adaptable. Right? They somehow have the defenses for that kind mm -hmm. of insane mutations. Unless uh, you get a huge load of bacteria that overwhelms you. Yeah, so we must have a uh, pretty sophisticated defense system. Oh, God, do we ever... And my friend who works in yeah. San Diego uh, on immune systems... Yeah. He says that life is at the boundary of the cell where there's a half a million receptors. Yeah. All sensing and fighting the battles against invaders. Constantly. Yeah. Constantly. And he said that's where life happens. It happens at that incredible uh, margin of the cell wall. Yeah, interesting, because that's what Bruce Lipton's into is the, mm -hmm. uh, the cellular membrane. Yep. And, whoa, well, there's another meteor. Another one. Interesting, yeah. The cellular membrane, and that's what... Uh, uh, Deemers into two uh, mm -hmm. membranes, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, each yeah. in their own way. Membranes are are, yeah. are amazing. I mean, the lipid molecule. It, 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 lipid molecules are like these fingers that stack next to each other, that aren't joined to each other. They're attracted, mm -hmm. and they flip one way and then the other. And by the fact that they're flipping all the time means that stuff can get through the membrane, so they're permeable. And, and yet, and they're self-repairing. But intelligently primitive. They don't let any, just any well, molecule once, through, right? Once you have um, a bare bones li uh, lipid membrane, it's not very intelligent. But once you have pores uh -huh. and active sensors, then you have the intelligence. It makes our border control agents look stupid. Oh know? yeah. No, I mean, and stuff is happening in you know yeah. nanosecond by nanosecond. And they're just allowing a constant flow of the right molecules mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. the membrane. And white blood cells, my God, I mean, they're, they're machines designed to detect and take out dangerous stuff, and they're constantly on control. Right? Viruses, bacteria, and Everything. fungi, mostly. Yeah, and I mean, any reading of a, you know, cellular biology text, you start going to this awestruck state. You yeah. know, you don't need a Bible or a cathedral. You know, you've got the most... Um, awestruck thing in just in, in cellular biology. Right. right. Microbiome. And then there's the microbiome in the system, which mostly is good, right? It's mostly, there's a lot of mm -hmm. microbials that mm -hmm. uh, that are not invaders, that are part of uh, uh, some some kind of symbiotic relationship with uh, yeah. human cells. So and they're, they uh, outnumber human cells. Right, so what are they mostly doing, you know? I mean, what the they are fuck? They are... I mean, we grew up with them. We, we exist because of the microbiome. Yeah. We are effectively mechanisms to feed a microbiome. Yeah, we are serving them in a way. Yeah, we are. Well, we're serving, we're serving this enormous thing called DNA. And is the microbiome part of a larger mat? Yeah. When you sh take a shit, when you eat something, you're taking in microbiome from outside. When you take a shit, you're donating it back. Oh. 
So you're, you're constantly cycling microbiome in and out of the body. When you rub your eyes or your nose, when you rub Moving your skin, around. you're we're, getting... We're serving them. Maybe they're the ones that want to uh, transport over to there. They're ready to jump off. And yeah, the and when we die, they eat us. <laughs> so... <laughs> Wow. Yeah, no, wow. we're we're and we're this wonderful temporary thing riding on top of all that. Can you imagine? And th this is this is why, you know, when I hear kind of the new agey stories about this kind of weak stuff about UFOs or about you know, all all the sort of nonsense stories I say I like to shake the people and say, just study what is and you'll be much more amazed and satisfied than stuff invented by people that is just nonsense. It's uns yeah. unsatisfying. <laughs> it's, it's a really, they're really poor stories. Yeah, they could be improved. I, 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 I got a caller in this week who, who uh, started spewing all these uh, conspiracy theories I hadn't heard before. I, I found it amusing for myself. I, I can't they're, collect them. They're boring. I mean, yeah. they're compared to what is, what reality is. You know? Yeah, yeah. And well... Some of the crowd pleasers are like uh, time travel, um, that we already have anti-gravity, we've developed that already in the past, and that, that uh, mm. there's a secret space program. Yeah, and that's all invented by people. And, and you probably run to it on the festival circuit. They're like David, David no. Wilcox and... I, I don't generally, no? because... Uh, David Wilcox, you don't talk to him? Or no, I, I would never want to talk to anybody. Or George like Norrie? It's yeah. all nonsense and it's not worth... A, a, a lifetime of having the ability to be on this earth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Reality waste, is for sure. To waste your time on stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 When you see the uh, the magic of what is. No. That's yeah. That's no. For the sure. magic of that what is, is. That is where the education uh, needs to uh, spark is the people yeah, uh, just to say holy fuck this is what's going and, on and you know yeah, this is amazing you know Alan yeah. I try yeah. to do it I, in my <laughs> podcast and in my talks yeah. at festivals and in my talks at science conferences and yeah. listen to my latest podcast number 50 you know when you just talked about it. yeah I'll tell you listen to fire in the sky because that's designed to open minds young minds to mm -hmm. what is you know and, and it's done in a creative way to reach them awesome and it's Check got it some science and some history and some speculation and mm -hmm. you know good music and it's only like 24 minutes long. Just try it on the little science geeks and like um, Gamber. Uh, yeah. Michael's grandson, daughter, or Jaya's granddaughter. Yeah, it, it's it's listenable by kids. In fact, the girl I was just talking to on the phone from Australia, mm -hmm. her daughter, she said, "I'm going to play this." She just heard it and she she called me and she was saying, "This is great." And she's, and she's gonna let her daughter hear. Well, well Elaine is thinking of having her daughter, um, you know, do homeschooling next year, and she'd want to tap the various people in Boulder Creek to help her educate mm -hmm. her daughter about things. Mm -hmm. And she's a supervisor. She gets straight A's in school, but she's so bored with school. Ah. Uh, and so she kind of feels like, is that all there is? Yeah. You know, you know, I don't blame her. You know, she and she gets depressed. Her. Yeah, I don't blame that either. So I think Amber is a bright light that deserves some attention. Um, well, I, I think we have done a wonderful yeah. Tubcast number four. So yeah, definitely I'll save that file right. and I'll put it up on the podcast. Awesome. So Good deal. Well, thank this you. This is the Thanks. Levity Zone signing off from Al's Tub. Yeah, we're going to go check out another video that should be done by now. Of, uh, yeah, thank you. Bruce's... Uh, and um, I can go comedy piece, and, yeah. Uh, comedy, yeah. From Symbiosis <laughs> Bruce, the the mad scientist uh, channeling Terence McKenna through Bill Nye yeah. without a bow tie, you know, for the pancake earth theory, breakfast theory. Yes. So you'll hear it all. Yeah, and it'll be up on YouTube and, before, uh, before. I'm liberated by comedy now. <laughs> okay, stay tuned. So there you have it. As you heard during our chat while steaming in the primordial soup, I have some pretty strong objections to Elon Musk's recent fantastical pronouncements and unrealistic and questionable plans for colonizing Mars. I wrote an opinion on social media which received a lot of commentary and has now grown into a full essay which I will post a link to on the entry for this podcast, 
number 51, on our website at www.levityzone.org. Al also mentioned my recent Flat Earth parody panel at the Symbiosis Festival, where, working with comedians J.P. Sears, Kumare, and others, a little comedy troupe sent up the river one of the more ludicrous conspiracy theories. Find a link to this, my first entree into comedy, also on the Levity Zone site. Thanks to Al Lundell for hosting this Tubcast and making the recording, to Bo Millward for doing some wonderful audio leveling, and to Peter Fay for his shot of Al and me in the tub at the very top of Future Peak here in Boulder Creek. Find the first 50 Levity Zone podcasts in all sorts of places, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and the Internet Archive. These are all downloadable and sampleable for your own projects, so please feel free to do that with my blessing. And see you next time in the Levity Zone.